Amen. All of that being said, let's move today into my scripture, if you will. We're going to go, today I'm preaching about church edition. And I do this uh, seasonally. I try to do this, and maybe not as much as I should, but today I'm going to preach about church edition. Growing the church, if you will. And looking today at this uh, passage of scripture found in the book of Acts, the second chapter, verses 42 through 47. As you're looking there, you can uh, see and, and comprehend uh, my message today is about the early church. It's about the first church. It's about the church that Jesus Christ died for. It is about the place to where the church began. Shortly after the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out. The church was birthed and went forward, and it's growing ever since. The body of Christ that we now call ourselves to be a part of, we are in that working mode. Amen? And so sometimes we don't get the idea of church growth uh, being this idea. Now, I've been preaching, and I told somebody, said, well, Pastor, I thought you were going to preach this series about the uh, harvest. Well, I can tell you something. As the church grows, the harvest goes. Amen? I'm not talking about building a building. And though I know these pictures, and I know tonight we're going to talk about construction of a new building and moving forward and doing some of those things, but I can tell you what we are talking about is not necessarily stone, stubble, wood. It's not that. We're not talking about aluminum or metal. What we're talking about is bringing bodies into the temple of God. Amen? Amen. Changing lives is what the church is all about. And church growth is not necessarily about anything uh, other than that. You can build big buildings and see hell split wide open by the lives of believers around you. It's not about the structure. It's about lives being changed. Somebody said, well, pastor, why do we need a new building? Because I'm going to tell you something. I believe that when we do our job and we do it effectively, this place won't hold everybody that God's going to bring. Amen? Amen. My message, I'm going to refer a couple things today as we go down through this passage of Scripture. Let me quickly, uh, again, get into my message. Thank you, Laura. Laura is back there in the corner. We put her in the corner because she's always in trouble. She's back there. She's doing the translating today. If you need a listening device to help with you in Spanish, she's translating the service Uh, And so we want to do that. We're also live streaming the service. So if you need that, there's headsets back there to assist you with that. Um, And uh, I had somebody tell me the other day, Pastor, I want to come to service, but I want to live stream you. I don't know how that will work. But if you want to try that, you could, I guess. I don't know. Uh, James, that would be difficult, right? No? No? You could do it. Don't do that. But this is a, but I, I wanted to say special, especially today, uh, I want to say a welcome to my parents who are here from Indiana. My mom and dad, they came in yesterday. Uh, my dad and mom were here a little bit yesterday during the women's meeting, and they got to see a few of the folks. And, and uh, dad, mom, stand up just to kind of greet people. And, and uh, they both said, we're too old to stand up, but we're glad to have you. I'm here because of you. I'm here because of you, and I thank you so much. I am very jealous. My dad has always had more hair than I do, Joe. It is just not fair. People look at me, and they look at my dad, and they said, what happened? I said, well, you can't grow hair on a busy street. So I am just, uh, we'll leave that alone. I'm not going to, Dad, I'm not saying you're not busy, but I must be really busy. But anyways, more than anything, I am so thrilled Sister Sandra, it is good to see you today. Would you just stand up and kind of turn around and wave? This is one of our newest miracles right here. Would you just stand for me? And she is here today. We've been praying for her. She just got back. She is, God has blessed her. She is a miracle. Amen. Went down to Mexico, had surgery, uh, spent a few days down there, about a week and a half, two weeks and a half. A month? It's been that long, really? And we prayed for her, and we prayed for her, and she, before she left, they gave her a clean bill of health. All the cancer is gone, and God is good. Amen? How many of you believe that? Amen? Sister Sandra, we love you. We're glad to see you. Amen. Oh, you're, she says, thank you for your prayers. Mercedes translating what I read in her lips. So, amen. It is good to see you. Thank you, Sister Sandra. We're so glad to have you. Amen. 
Amen. We are so thrilled with what God is doing and answering our prayers and our prayer ministry and our prayer church. If you're missing Tuesday night prayer, you're missing a miracle. Amen. I believe that with all my heart, God is anointing our services as we pray and we come together. If you know someone who needs a miracle, you come on Tuesday night. We'll be sure to anoint them with oil, pray over them, and believe God for that. Amen. We start at Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. We pray from 7 to 8. We pray and we'll pray over any need that God brings to us. Amen. And so if you have that opportunity, you want to come be a part of that, come and celebrate with us. Acts, the second chapter. Starting in verse 42, this is a very familiar section of Scripture to many of us, but if you will, I want you to pay special attention. I'm going to go back through these Scriptures, but I want to read them all together at one time. Acts, the second chapter, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as any one had need so continuing daily with one accord and in one in the temple and breaking bread from house to house they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved I want to say this again and I, I, I want you to get this today more than anything, to me, church growth is about reaching the lost and seeing them saved. That's what it is. I know that, and I thank the Lord for everyone and anyone that comes, and I thank you for the, the, those that have come from backgrounds in the church, and I hope and pray that you continue to grow in your faith as you stay here. But I believe that the objective of the church is to reach the lost and dying world. We could fill this building three or four times over if we would just look for lost people and bring them to the house of God. Amen. Amen. And I believe that the objective of the church is to reach the lost. I believe with all my heart that we, we can look at this and see this. And, and the activity that we see in the early church. Go ahead, Johnny, and pull that next one up. The activity of the early church w broke down into many different things. And a lot of times we have substituted what we do in church for a lot of different things. And we, we have a lot of things that we add to and, and bring about in the services. But the first thing that they did was they, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I believe that one of the most important things that you can get is get a firm foundation of what we believe and why you believe it amen I believe that there are so many people that come to church that don't really care they just come to church out of obligation or necessity amen there's a lot of people that I grew up in the church and I, I grew up in the church and, and from a very young child, I, I knew what I believed and I knew what the church believed. And, and there's so many people that sometimes we just go for convenience or we just go out of habit or we just go to do our religious thing. But I will tell you something, you need to know what your church stands for. I heard somebody say the other day, well, it doesn't really matter where you go to church as long as you go to church. That is not true. If they're teaching something that is not biblically correct, you do not want to be there and be fed by it. I don't care how much money or how much they will give you. You do not need to be a part of something that is not biblically correct. Now, I can't say it any clearer than that. And there's some people out there and there's some places out there. There's some places that will give you what, a, a lot of things and they will do for you. And, and I, when I was in Payson, I saw that firsthand on many different levels. But I will tell you the most important thing that a church can do for its believers and its constituents is, is giving them the word of God. Many churches are doing away with Sunday school. They were, they're doing away with teaching on Wednesday night. They just want to have activities. But I will tell you the most important thing that we can do is get the Word of God out and teach it and preach it so that the Word of God becomes our life strength. It becomes our habit to begin to understand that we must get the Word of God in the believer's hearts. Just going to, just starting off in, a, in that way, understanding the idea of, of the biblical doctrine, understanding the principle of Jesus Christ. 
and saying this is the foremost of everything that we do is that we realize that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. And if we get away from that character, if you think you can work your way or buy your way into heaven, you are strongly mistaken. The Bible tells us the gospel of Jesus Christ is the main principle. Jesus is the main theme from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. He is the theme of Scripture. And if you try to deviate from Jesus Christ being the most important factor in the Bible, you are wrong. I believe that the, the biblical doctrine that we have in the Apostles' Creed and, and many of the things that we can quote, and it, it's not about just saying Scripture. It's not about just meaning that. My grandson is going through a program in the Awanas, and he, he's, he's doing very well at it. He can quote quite a few Scriptures, and I am so excited to see them begin to, begin to learn Scripture. But I told him, I said, it's not just enough to say a Scripture and have it memorized. You need to know what that Scripture means and what it ties into and how it principles build upon it. I'm going to tell you something. If you can rattle, I gotta, I, I've got friends and family members and folks that I know that know more Scriptures than I do, uh, that, that, that right now they're going to split hell wide open if they don't wake up and realize they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I believe that we need to be steadfast in our, our, our doctrine. We need to understand what the doctrine is. One of the things that I like about the church of God and understand about it, if you don't know what our doctrine is, you need to get on our church website. It's got it spelled out right there in the doctrine. It tells you everything that we believe. If you're not sure what we represent, you need to ask. You need to begin to figure it out. Don't wander through it. Understand it. I believe we need fellowship. One of the things that I believe that's most important about us going forward as a church is fellowship. You need me and I need you. We're all part of the family. Amen? We need each other. And there's, there's people that are out there that want to, I'll, I'll just do my own thing. I don't need anybody else, just me and God. Let me tell you something. God didn't divine and didn't design the body of Christ in that way. That is not the fashion of what God wants for us. He brought us together for fellowship, and we need each other. Amen. We need to be encouraged. That's why I love it when we have our, our small groups with our men and women, women's groups. I, I, I love it because we have uh, our Sunday school groups, and I love it because we have these groups together. It thrills my heart, the smaller groups. It can make it work. Amen. We need the fellowship. We need to have one of the things that I, I, I think that, and, and, and Chuck, in all the reviewing of all the buildings and the plans and everything that we sit down with, you know what's most disappointing for me in the buildings that we have right now? We don't have a big enough building to have a fellowship dinner. They used to call it potluck. How many of you like fellowship dinners? Oh, I do too, man. I love them. We got some of the best cooks in the world right here. There's chicken enchiladas. and uh, Chris, she tried to sneak a, a sauerkraut cake in on me one time. Yeah, I know better than that. I sniffed that baby out. She said, oh, you'll never know. I know. But when I look at all these different things and all these blessings, we don't have a room big enough to put the entire church in. We need some place to eat together. Amen. Not because we're, we're all looking at each other and we're going to watch Phil drool down his chin or anything like that. That's not what it's about. It, it's, it's so that we can rub elbows with one another. It's so, I, I can tell you this. There's a friend of mine that, that's probably one of, that grew to be one of my best friends. When we first went to Chandler to pastor there, the first Sunday they did a, a greet the new pastor thing. And, and Sister... Uh, it, we, we sat at the dinner and Barbara, when she was there, she said, Pastor, I'm going to invite my husband. He's, he doesn't come to church with me, but I want him to meet you. I'm thinking, oh, no, I didn't even know who he was. They sat down and they, they decided that they were going to put me in the back so I, I could see everybody and everybody could see me. The best thing about being a new pastor in a new church is they'll let you go first. So I went first. I loaded up. I sat down. 
And I, everybody else came in, and they all began to go through and eat, and they were all eating and everything, and everybody got their food. They all sat down and just blessed by, by the food and everything that was there. But Leonard, there was no other seats except the one by me. And Barbara said, Pastor, God worked that out. Because during that meal, we talked about Christ. And Leonard wasn't a church man at all. As a matter of fact, he didn't like organized church. There's too many hypocrites, what he said. Now he's one of them. Amen. No, just kidding. But we met at that meal. He began to talk to me. His wife volunteered him. He's, we were getting ready to paint, and we needed to paint in some, a couple Sunday school rooms. And she said, Pastor, Leonard's a good handyman. He can paint, and he can get right in there and paint. So I put him to work, and we started painting together. And we went to, to working around the church, and I put, I, I, he did everything. I mean, you name it, we did it. When we did it together, he'd, I, we had to lay tile in the front room. He showed me. He found out how bad of a construction worker I really am. They don't, they don't let me uh, handle power tools for a reason. I'm very dangerous with a power tool. Don't, anything sharp, don't give it to me. Anything that you can throw up and down like a hammer, I can hurt people with that. So, but Leonard was brave enough to stay with me. And from that potluck dinner, that, that dinner of greet the pastor, I'm going to tell you something. If you really want to cr get a crowd of people, put a sign out, so, out, out front that says free dinner. All you can eat until the food runs out. You know what? We would have a line from here all the way down baseline, all the way to the freeway, probably. But I'm going to tell you something. Those people that come in here, we just don't want them to come and eat. We want them to feel and hear the love of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not just about getting together to, to eat. We need fellowship with one another. We need a place to do that. We need a place where we can draw people in so we can do that and throw it in. Right now, if we have a dinner, we have to eat in shifts. We have a room over there that'll seat about 80, maybe 100 if you really crowd them in. And that's, that's if you hook arms while you're eating. But if we have a building over there that seats about 80, and it's, I love it, but but we don't have room to put everybody in it. We need a bigger place to eat. Amen? It's family supper. We need it. We need it. We need to be able to minister to it. We need fellowship. We need to, the breaking of bread and coming together. That's the communion. That's the sacraments. We've been teaching that on Wednesday nights. We need to understand about what the sacraments mean. Uh, and, and we need to look at it in a different way. Uh, the, the, the work of communion, what it represents and what it means. I never will forget when Laura and Manny came and they, the first time that they were here for communion, they had done a communion in the, in the, the tradition of the religion that they were a part of before. But they, have, they had never done it since they had been saved. And they were participating, I believe it was for the first time. And, and I, re, I never will forget when I explained what the body and the blood was all about. And they took that communion. I, I remember looking at Laura and Manny and tears running down both their faces. Because they had done it religiously, but they had never done it for relational reasons. And they realized what it was all about. I never will forget, Wednesday night we talked about some of the sacraments of the church and so, some of the things that we do. We believe in foot washing, and, 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 and some people, they, they say, well, that's, that's old tradition. That's, that's something in the Old Testament. I believe that we need servanthood back in the church as never before. We need to understand what it means to serve one another. Amen. Amen. We need to understand what those sacraments mean. We need to understand the work of, of what it comes to and, and, and beginning to understand that. We need prayer. More than anything, the Bible tells us the activity of the church must be prayer. You want the least attended service in any church of any size is prayer usually. Prayers, meetings, and prayer services are, seem to be the least significant or the least attended. Sometimes there's not enough to start a good fight. Some of you that, that have been in church circles, you I can chuckle like that, Joe, right? You've been around a few of those prayer circles. I can tell you that the, the prayer ten, tends to be something that I'll do it when I need it. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe that God will allow you to fall in a hole. God will let your world fall apart. He'll bring, allow you to, to see the world turn upside down and things happen in your life because he's trying to drive his church back to prayer. 
And if it takes it to get you on your knees, then I say, God, do what you've got to do to teach your church to pray again. The church needs to wake up and realize the importance of prayer. It's just not something to bless your food and thank the Lord for. It's just not something to say at night. It's something that you need to live in. The Bible tells us that we should pray always and pray without ceasing. Prayer needs to be a part of our life. The activities of the church. I believe that you need to support the leadership of the church. It should be important that we see the leadership risen to the very front of the church. We know that on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and preached and 3,000 were saved. As they begin to put it in order, the apostles begin to guide and direct the new young church that had just gotten started. They were trying to figure out what order they should be in and how it should be done. They begin to take the teachings of Christ and begin to apply it to the very principles of this new young church. I believe that we must see and understand the power uh, that God says. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, and I've been a part of many uh, of church dinners. Matter of fact, I've been the centerpiece of most of them. We have pastor roasts. We, we talk about the pastor. Well, he didn't preach very good. His suit didn't match. His shirt was pink today. Oh, my goodness. Can you believe it? I mean, you can go on and on. You can, you can talk about, listen, but I believe that you need to support. You, the Bible tells me that if you talk too bad about the pastors, God's going to send a she-bear out to eat you. I'm just saying it happened in the Old Testament. Leadership of the church. Go ahead and pull those scriptures up. The Bible says, And then fear came upon every soul, and many of the signs and wonders were done through the apostles. And now all who believed were together and had all things in common. When we look at this, we begin to realize the necessity of leadership. It takes leadership to guide and direct. The Bible says that there are offices that must be filled in the church to be effective as a church. And many of those things are left on the sideline as insignificant and not really that important for the church today. And that's why I believe the church church needs to rise up and see the offices of the church filled again and continue to do the work that God has called us to do. I believe that leadership must start and we must have the head as Christ and Christ must lead and guide and direct in all things. But I believe that the leadership of the church must represent itself well. I believe that it must be uh, learned and they must know what they're teaching and they must stand up on the principles. You need a pastor that has good character. Not just a character that's a, a pastor. I believe with all my heart that God called me to be a pastor. I believe with all my heart that that's what God has placed in me to do. I knew it when I was small. I remember as a child, we used to play church. And Brother Bledsoe, you and, and, and Sister Bledsoe have told about it, what you used to do. And me and my sister, we used to do this. And we would line up my sister's dolls and all of our, our stuff. And, and we would have a church services. And we would pretend like we were Brother So-and-So and Sister So-and-So. And, and we, would, we would pretend like that. And I'm going to tell you something. I remember going up in the church. But there was a time in my life when I looked at the church and the leadership of the church. And I began to say, I don't want to be that you see when I went to college I could I, I was only thinking about one thing I want to go somewhere and learn a lot so I can be rich that's 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 what I thought and there are a lot of young people today that are that are jumping into the to the the realm of what school is and and they're going to school and they're taking occupations and they're they're doing jobs and I'm going to tell you something I, I'm telling you when I went to to Lee I went there and I was going to be an accountant and I was, I, that's what I wanted to be because if I didn't have a lot of money, I, at least I could count a lot of people's money that had it. But when you have dyslexia, it is awful dangerous for you to have dyslexia and be an accountant. There are a few lawyers that might have it. But anyways, I can, when I look at this and I begin to think about the idea of leadership, it, there, is a, there is a realm of leadership that must be served in the church. We need to support that leadership. And I thank the church that we are here today. And as I look at this, uh, begin to think about this, I, I tell you this with all my heart. We have a church that loves to bless your pastor. 
I go all the way back to Brother Bledsoe. He sowed that seed in the lives of the church. And I've seen that character. And they stand up and they're faithful to it. But I'm going to tell you something. Just giving money is not all there is to being faithful to your pastor. It's coming alongside of them and say, can I help you? Can I do this? And not have the, instead of pushing the pastor aside and saying, I can do it better than you, that's great. I'll be the first to give it to you. But supporting the pastor and coming alongside of it and say, I'll be there with you. I'll help you. I want to see the church go forward. And if I can help, I will. Sometimes it's just helping to pass out flyers. Sometimes it's coming to set up stuff. Sometimes it's getting there early. Sometimes it's staying late to lock up and be, not be the first one out, but be the last one out. That's something that the church needs today is people who will say, Pastor, you don't have to stay. I'll lock up. Instead of saying, come on, hon, we're going to beat the Baptist to the restaurant. We got to run out of here as soon as church is over. You know what we need to do? Pastor, is it anything? I love it when people say, Pastor, I walked the campus before I left today, picked up some trash. Pastor, I just went by and checked and made sure all the doors were locked. I just did. That's, what, that's what supporting your pastor is all about. Being there when we have events and doing things with them, taking part of that, that's, that makes a pastor feel like, hey, you really want to be a part of what God is doing. Amen. I believe, thirdly, you need to support it financially. The Bible says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 45 says, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. And I believe that the responsibility of the church is to continue to support it faithfully with your tithe as much as you can. I believe that you should tithe whether your church needs it or not. Because you don't tithe because the church needs it. You tithe because you're being obedient to God's word. I know this is not a popular opinion, and a lot of people would just assume you didn't preach about tithing. But I will tell you something. I know why people like to have the option just to give to the church. is because they can pick and choose. I believe in tithing. I believe that 10% of what God blesses you with ought to be put into tithe. Not because God is broken. God needs your money. God needs your heart. And most of the time, your money will follow your heart. And I've had people that have come to this church for several months and said, Pastor, I didn't even know. You don't even take an offering. No. I've learned since I have been at this church that it's not the will of the church or the purpose of the church to take your money. It's the privilege that you have to give it. Amen? That's why we got that little brown box back there. Manny, can you just walk over there and hold that box up? Be, be my Vanna White. See that, that, that box right back there? Just, just hold it up there. Lift it up high. That box right there. That's, that's, all you have to do is when you come in, when you drop it off on your way out, you, you can give in that box. You can give. You can support this church. You can go online and give. You can do. There's so many different ways to give. Thank you, Vanna. And when you come together and you, and you realize all the things that you can do, it's, it's not hard to give to God unless you don't want to let it go. When it becomes difficult to give to God is when you don't want to, when you think of all the things you can do with your money instead of being obedient to God. God will bless the faithfulness of your consistency. I've seen Him honor it time and time again. I like what it says in Malachi, and I, I'm not meddling, I'm just preaching a little bit today. One of the things that I believe that that happens in the church is a lot of times we see the church being blessed and we think, well, I need it more than the church does. I'm going to tell you something. This church has been blessed. We are blessed today. Good stewardship has put us where we are today. And it must continue. If we are going to have confidence in the future of this church, you have got to see good stewardship. Amen. I believe that when the church is 
is financially stable, sometimes people begin to think about the fact that the church is all about money. I've seen churches that are all about money. I remember growing up and being around church pastors who would take a third offering just so the bills would be met in the church. I remember one time when I, I heard a, a businessman stand up in a meeting to take an offering and said, ushers, lock the doors. No one is leaving until we collect enough to pay the payment on this building. I'm going to tell you something. If it has to be drug out of you and begged out of you, and if it has to be brought that way, then you're not giving it. Somebody's trying to take it from you. Amen. I believe that when you have a heart to give, you will be. God blesses a cheerful giver. Now, he'll take it from a grouch, but he will bless a cheerful giver. You know, I had another sermon earlier in the week that I was going to preach. I told Alejandro, it's a much nicer sermon. I'll preach it another day. Stay with me. They attended the church. Oh, here I go. Here I go. I'm going to meddle now a little bit. It's a shame. So they continued daily in one accord in the temple. One of the things that I like to see and I like to hear about is when I see people that are doing churches and multiple services and multiple events and, and activities that seem to be multiple in days and ways. Churches right now that are actually literally meeting every day of the week. Now that's not saying every person is there every day of the week, but they're there and the church is open every day of the week. Now, here's the problem. We hit and miss when we want to go to church. The Bible says not to neglect the gathering of the saints in Hebrews. And, and, and Hebrews 10 and 25 tells us that we're not to neglect the gathering of the saints because I'm going to tell you something. We become weakened. Amen. I hope and pray that we get, that, that God blesses us so that we get, we, and I, I am so, Amanda, I am so glad that you had to sit in a different location. I told her she threw everything out of whack today. She had totally messed it up. She is sitting in the back back there, and I can't see her right here in the front. She's, James, you, you took her seat. Amanda, I'm sorry. You can, you can whoop on James after church. Here's what I'm tell you. There is no assigned seats. And I'm going to tell you something. If you think you got an assigned seat or an assigned parking place, I'm praying that God fill this place up so you have to walk a country mile to get to the church. Amen. Well, I'm not going to go if you're going to be that way about it, Pastor. I'm going to tell you something. It would be great if God's people would have to give up their seats so people can come in the church. Or we would have to get here early enough to get our seat. <laughs> oh, that was mean, Pastor. You didn't have to go there. Go ahead and pull that scripture up, Johnny. Hebrews 10, 25, 24 and 25 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir uh, up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. I need you, you need me, we're all part of the family. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> we, need, we need each other. And, and a lot of times, I can sit at home or on the way home, I'll think in my mind, who's missing at church today? Because there's a row that's empty. I know, I know Amanda wasn't here because she's she her seat was gone. There was nobody in it. I missed it. I I missed Brother Far and Sister Far. I, I missed it. They weren't they weren't in their spot. But I can say now. Wait a minute. I saw Amanda in the back of the church. I saw I, she was here, and you know what? That thrills me because what it means is that somebody came in that shook this place up. Somebody made a difference and somebody said, I don't know where I'm supposed to go, but, but give me a seat and I'll sit down. Amen. 
I love it. We, we used to have, when I was in Logan Sport and we would have a church and the, the, the attendance was getting to the place to where the church was being filled and we would have people that were regular attenders in our church that would get there intentionally early so they could walk a person down the aisle and set them in their seat and say, I want to set you here. If, you, if there's room left when the service starts, I'll come set with you. Amen? Amen. It, 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 this is not rocket scientist how to make a church grow. It just means you gotta, you got to give to the place where... Uh, listen, if you count the amount of empty seats right here, you can look around. There's enough. We could, we could knock out some more people. I, I, when, when we get this place full is when we have to figure out how to get more chairs in here. Now, Pastor Barman, when the Marshallese service, well, he, he came and told me this the night that they had their revival here at the church. And they started it here, and he said, Pastor, there's going to be about 250 to 300 Marshallese kids here. And when he told me that, I said, yeah, I've heard pastors say that before. We'll be lucky to have 100, 150. And that's what I, I, and when he said that to me, I said, okay, yeah, right. And then I showed up, and I get here an hour and a half before service starts, and there are already people in the parking lot waiting to get in the church. When I open the doors and I begin to see the different people, all of a sudden, Brother Bledsoe, I opened the doors, and they just kept coming. I didn't know there were that many Marshallese people in the state of Arizona. We were overrun. We, we literally, every seat that we had in every classroom in this building was filling this sanctuary. We counted at least 300 people in this room. There was an aisleway that was down the middle, and you literally, when they, I was sitting in the back, and I had to preach, and I, you know, it makes you feel good, because I really thought that Pastor Barman had told him I was preaching, and that's why all of them showed up. But when he called me up front, he said, we want to have Pastor Pratt come and speak. I, I literally, now I know I'm a little chubby, but I had to turn sideways to go down the aisleway. So I said, well, I ain't going to church at that. Shame on you. I hope heaven is so crowded that you have to turn sideways to get in it. Amen? I hope that I hope heaven is so full. I hope that we celebrate and there's so many people from every language, every color. I believe it. Come on, amen. I believe what heaven's going to look like is beautiful. And I believe the church should look just like that. I, I can't wait for the day when we have to break out another, an, another translator back there. We'll speak another language. Pastor Barman says he's going to teach me how to speak Marshallese. I'm waiting for them to finish teaching me how to speak English. <laughs> Amen. They had fellowship. They loved one another. They had fellowship. The Bible says that, and they were breaking bread from house to house, and they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They had fellowship. They were with their other brothers and sisters in Christ. The idea of breaking bread in the first part of this sermon was about the communion, the act of communion. This particular part of it is the idea of fellowshipping together. They went together and they ate together. Oh, listen. One of the greatest things you can do for somebody is invite them to go eat with you. I'm not begging for food. As you can well tell, I eat well. I eat more than I should, and I am trying to watch what I eat. I look at every bite, I promise you. But I will tell you this. It's great if you take somebody that you've seen at church a couple times, and you say, hey, would you go eat with me? Let's go eat together. you got to eat dinner, right? Well, my wife's got a pot roast on, and hey, I love pot roast. Invite yourself with them. Come on. No, I'm just, here's what I'm saying. Have fellowship. Don't be afraid to have fellowship with one another outside of this place. Amen? 
It's good. Call somebody and say, hey, why don't you come over and have dinner with me? If, if you don't have anything to talk about or anything in common, talk about how the pastor wore a pink shirt to church on Sunday. Find something and fellowship with somebody because you can make a difference in their life. Brother Bledsoe, when we were in Indianapolis, Indiana, my father-in-law was working with the bus route. And he said, whenever I drove the bus, I would tell the kids if I wanted to fill the bus, all I had to say was, we're going to McDonald's for everybody who rides the bus on the way home. And he said, I would literally have kids coming from out of the woodwork to go to McDonald's on the way home from church. Now, now here's the thing. I told him, I said, that is such a good thing. He said, oh, no, 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 you, you're not seeing a, the half of it. I mean, I could, I could fill and feed a whole bus of kids for about $20 at McDonald's. That was years ago, by the way. But anyways, that's when they had those 39-cent hamburgers. But sometimes you just got to make yourself... I, and, and you know what he would say? He said, I didn't even go there to eat. I would watch the kids eat because it was so exciting how happy it made them just to get that hamburger. Sometimes just taking somebody and saying, hey, will you go? It just makes a difference. Amen? I, I got, I've got to move on. I know I'm, I'm, I'm meddling. They enjoyed the fellowship. They were together with fellowship. They had a good time together. Listen, I believe that with all my heart. Lastly, I believe that they worship together. The Bible says they were praising God and having favor with all the people. They began to come together to worship God. They praised God and they gave God thanks for everything that he had blessed them with. Just the praising of God is to give thanks to God for all that he has given to you. I can go around this room and I can ask this question. And you, you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because you know this right now. You are blessed. You have been blessed. Now, you don't have everything in this world. You may not have a, a million dollars. You may not have ten dollars. But you are blessed. You are blessed because, first of all, you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. The second thing is, is that you know that God will supply all of your needs. According, and you will never do without when you have God. Now, you, will, you may never have the abundance of the world, but I don't think that we need it. I'm going to say something. If, if kids, if you're listening, plug your ears because this is for the parents. I'm just kidding. Isaac, don't plug your ears. We spoil our kids. We make them think that they've got to have all the things that the rest of the world has. We pacify them. I can tell you this, that some of the happiest, funnest times that you can have is, with kids is when you just create fun. You create it. You, you get out there and you do something. I, 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 just, I, I never will forget the, the first time that I was given the responsibility to teach children's church and, and, and I had to give it. And, and, and I, I took the kids out because I knew how to play football and I just organized a, 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 a scrimmage game. And we played football in children's church. We, had we, we were done with the lesson. I said everything I knew in about five minutes. I took them all out. They were all dressed in their Easter clothes, but I'm going to tell you something. When they're finished, I still have one young lady that tells me all the time, she says, Pastor, the reason that I'm in church doing what I'm doing today is because you taught me that you could have fun and go to church. You don't have to do all the, the things that, that some of them are doing today. You don't have to do all those things. Sometimes just spending time with their kids. Now, they're going to tell you, I'm the only one that doesn't have these new tennis shoes. It won't kill them not to have them. I'm the only one that doesn't have this. or don't. Ha I'm the only one that doesn't. Then you are so blessed. When it, when it comes down to it, one of the greatest things you can do is realize that you can give thanks to God, not because of the things you don't have, but because of the things you do have. Take inventory and thank God. 
Because as you do these things, the Bible says, and the Lord added to the church daily those that were uh, being blessed and being saved. And those that God had touched, he touched for a very biblical reason, and that is because they wanted to be part of the fellowship of believers. I have preached extremely quickly today. Laura, have you kept up with me? She's trying to say the last sentence really fast. I did this for a reason. Because I believe this with all my heart. Every service, everything that the church does, from Sunday school, every service that this church does, Awana's family training hour, Every service that we do, every outreach service, everything that we do should be geared around one major event. And that is leading people to Jesus Christ. The reason that the church should exist is to touch the lives of the lost.